Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Lowry. I am a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for a webinar on the report that was just released this morning uh, titled Review of the New York City Watershed Protection Program. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu, and we'll also chat that link out to you. A recording of this webinar will be available in the coming weeks on our website. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study statement of tasks. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by the committee chair, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. You can simply submit a question at any time during the presentation, uh, click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and type in your question. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Barton, who served as the chair of the committee. He is a professor in the Department of Environmental Conservation at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and his research centers on the links between land use, stream flow, and water quality. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barton. Thanks very much, Megan. And thank you everyone for joining us. So I have the nearly impossible task of summarizing a, a 400 page report. Let me begin with an overview of New York City water supply system with a few key points and then move on to this slide. Uh, the system is, is uh, enormous in extent. It encompasses about a million acres in the Catskills and about 200,000 acres in East of Hudson watershed. It delivers 1 billion gallons a day of water to 8.5 million people in New York and about a million people living along the aqueduct. It has been uh, uh, successfully in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act and the surface water treatment rule since 1993 with a succession of five filtration avoidance determinations. They're issued by the US EPA and the New York State Department of Health. This didn't happen by accident, of course. It's a combination of the, the high ambient water quality in the system the operational skill and dedication of the New York City DEP staff, the effectiveness of the Watershed Protection Program, and the partnership approach that was fostered by the Memorandum of Agreement all these many years ago between New York City DEP, the watershed communities, and state and federal agencies. This table from chapter one shows the scope of the Watershed Protection Program to date, with investments, as you can see, of $2.5 billion. We began our work um, in, in a figurative sense by tracing the outline of the elephant here by looking at the relative investments in different parts of the program. And as you can see, the wastewater treatment program uh, upgrades water, water treatment plants for municipalities and city owned plants encompassed about 40% of the total investment. The land acquisition program comprised nearly 20%. And the major programs shown in green and, uh, include about 90% of the watershed protection program investments to date. And that's not to say that the, the smaller programs and the smaller expenditures are, are not important. They all contribute to the cumulative positive effect of the program. We began our work by consulting uh, and thoroughly studying the work of our predecessors from 1997 to 1999 that resulted in this 2000 report. This was a prospective review and that the watershed protection program was just beginning. And the question that committee was addressing was, would it work? Uh, our, our work was both retrospective, looking back at the last 20 years and prospective looking ahead, especially at, at the next 10 to 20 years to see how the program might be improved. Both the 2000 committee and the 2020 committee uh, returned over and over again to the memorandum of agreement as the template or as the foundational uh, element of the watershed protection program 
and the five filtration avoidance determinations. As Megan mentioned, the, a, a, an academy committee begins with a statement of task, which is another way of saying a charge to the committee, or in lay terms, a, a rigorous checklist that we consult at the beginning of every meeting and at every round of writing and revision and review of our report to ensure that we've, we've delivered on these five very complex open-ended items. As a committee, we adopted the old shaker maxim, anything can be done better as our working philosophy, not in a critical or pejorative sense, but by dedicating ourselves to the development of an authentic consensus report to serve the common good for the long term. And by authentic, I mean that it wasn't a simple majority of the committee, but the entirety of the committee that agreed on, on its content and tone. The statement of task was read at the beginning of every meeting and consulted frequently. This committee um, ha had eight meetings, which is two more than the norm, a number of study tours organized by Watershed Protection Program partners and other site visits and numerous information requests to the New York City DEP, Watershed Ag Program, Casco Watershed Corporation and, and others. It's a large committee, 17 members, capably supported by the National Academy staff, in particular by Dr. Laura Ehlers, who was the study director for the 2000 study and the recent 2018 study of a software package called the Operation Support Tool that I'll mention a little bit about later. Between the 17 committee members, we have at least 500 collective years of training and experience. It was a very collegial group. That's not to say that we didn't have our, dis our differences, and, uh, but even in our most contentious discussions, we're uh, constructive and respectful and aimed at meeting the statement of task and delivering the best quality product that we could. Serving on a National Academy Committee is an intense experience. It's over and above your day job, so to speak. So it requires people who are dedicated to this kind of public service. And I thank my colleagues for rendering it so capably. Before I continue into some of the details, I'd like to address some of the core concepts and key themes that pervade this presentation and moreover our, our report. The first two items should go without saying, um, but uh, shouldn't be left unsaid. The uh, third item, the Watershed Protection Program appears to us to be entering a new phase, and for a variety of reasons, that new phase is more important than ever. Finally, we, uh, encourage New York City DEP and all the watershed protection partners and watershed communities and the like to adopt what is called the adaptive management paradigm. And that is a formal systematic way of integrating monitoring measurements, statistical analyses, modeling and program impl implementation. So we all learn by doing and improve the product and project as it goes along. A particular tool that we'll, we'll note in, in this presentation, our report, is something called the mass balance, which instead of just measuring water quality concentrations of pollution, which is uh, typically needed for compliance monitoring or required, a mass balance endeavors to, to do just that, to find the total quantity of pollutants moving towards the reservoir. And finally, I'll note something that many of you already appreciate and know that the New York City Watershed Protection Program is a national and international example. That photograph shows Steve Parker, former director of the Water Science and Technology Board, on a study tour in Oregon in 2007, during which uh, our host uh, from the Portland, water, the Portland, Oregon water supply showed us his copy, which is notable for all the sticky notes in the margin. So to be on a little bit of background that is included in chapter two, if we had a photographic record of the Catskills region over the last 400 years at 50 year intervals, we would see a radically transformed landscape, especially in the 19th century, that period between 1820 and 1870. In about 1920, a few years before, the Ashokan Reservoir would appear on the horizon from Slide Mountain. Uh, formerly uh, a, a long settled agricultural valley. And it's worth noting that the Watershed Protection Program is, has only encompassed, although it seems like much longer, a 20 or 25 year period of this long timeline, 400 years, about the lifespan of a hemlock tree. 
the landscape has been had been transformed during that period of time, and, and we have a wonderful record in Michael Kudish's work to show the effects of the bark peelers working for tanneries that cut hundreds of thousands of acres of mature, mature hemlock trees, the bluestone quarries, furniture factories, cooperage mills, mountain houses, and various boarding houses, and the railroads like the Ulster and Delaware that connected it to the outside world and international markets. Add to them more than 200 water powered sawmills on virtually every large tributary, about 20 charcoal operations, and hundreds and hundreds of small family farms, some with family heritage dating back to a Revolutionary War land grant to a veteran who was the patriarch of their family. So chapter two traces these ecological, historical, and cultural antecedents to look at the sources and the continuing legacy effects, as ecologists call them, of these historical land and resource uses, some of which date, again, from the 1700s. It's no surprise, therefore, that one of the marquee stream management program uh, projects, a full channel restoration project that we'll see more about in relation to chapter six, occurs on a reach of Stony Clove downstream from a number of sawmills adjacent to a railroad grade a road and several furniture factories. But even after this long period of, of uh, extractive resource use, uh, during which on, only 6% of the Catskills region escaped direct human influence, this ecosystem has recovered to a remarkable degree and is now supporting high ambient water quality again. So this is all to say that a pristine water, a pristine wilderness with no people and no human activities is not a necessary precondition for the production of clean water. Pristine wilderness areas do not produce deionized distilled water, contrary to popular belief. Chapter three focused in detail on the New York City water supply system. And I invite you to review it uh, to fill in the gaps that I left at the fumbling beginning of this presentation. It, it, incl it includes four findings and recommendations that are somewhat of a miscellaneous list. Let me walk you through them. Covering the Hillview Reservoir, we felt should be a top infrastructure priority. This is the Kensico Reservoir, which is the confluence of the Catskill and Delaware Aqueduct, where the final blending and mixing takes place, before being disinfected um, with chlorine and with ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet light, and then reaching the Hillview Reservoir, the balancing reservoir immediately before the water enters the distribution system for New York City. We also note that uh, succession planning and professional, continued professional development should be undertaken to ensure that the essential staff that operate the New York City water supply are always in place. It goes without saying, but we sometimes forget that a water utility needs to operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week in perpetuity. And as I'll, I'll present in just a moment, that is, is a challenging task to say the least, even with the operational flexibility um, that New York City system has. We encourage work and, and effort on scaling up watershed protection efforts when they're necessary in the face of harmful algal blooms that often produce unacceptable tastes and odors and other changes in regulations that may make it more difficult to comply with, uh, with EPA and State Department of Health regulatory uh, edicts. And finally, we conducted uh, a, a prototype economic analysis with the uh, data that, limited data that were available to us to determine that embarking on a large filtration plant does not seem to be the best investment of New York City or other taxpayer funds at this time in support of public health, economic, and environmental objectives. Chapter four is a transitional chapter that lays out some of the necessary background information that sets up the program review chapters five through 11. It begins with an overview of watershed hydrology and continues through these four points. Let me add a few footnotes before venturing into them in a little bit more detail. We'll focus a lot on phosphorus in this presentation and in our report because phosphorus is, is something that's been measured and monitored 
in great detail in the watershed and was a rich data resource for us to analyze. But it's also a surrogate for these other pollutants of concern. That is to say that eroded soil that causes turbidity, dissolved organic matter and microbial pathogens are in effect along for the ride with stormwater along with phosphorus, nitrogen, and, and other water quality constituents of concern. Most of that transport, as you know, occurs during rain and snow melt events. Some of it occurs during dry weather and solution. And a lot of it happens during the dormant season, during fall rainstorms, during spring snow melt, and during extreme weather events at other times of the year. In almost all cases, it derives from multiple sources, and it takes some effort to determine where the phosphorus, nutrients, organic matter came from. I'll briefly describe likely climate change effects and then the stress test of the water supply system using this operation support tool that I referred to a moment ago. First, hydrology and systems operations. An average year in the Catskills um, has about an equal division between water that's lost to evaporation, to water used by plants, and otherwise returns to the atmosphere, and the remainder of that water that flows to streams by way of groundwater and surface water flow paths. In contrast, a dry year has about the same, sometimes more evaporative loss, and stream flow is a, reflect a reflection of the paucity of rain and snow melt during that period of time. Wet years, which many of you remember all too well. This is a shot of the Gilboa Dam during Tropical Storm Irene. Evaporation is about the same, but when there's an extraordinary amount of rain and snow, the conversion to stream flow, as you can see, in this case, cre created more stream flow than there was rain and snow in an average year. Just to stress the importance of operations and, and the expertise of the New York City DEP staff and the importance of the Watershed Protection Program as a whole, regardless of the source conditions, climate and stream flow conditions, water coming out of the tap has to look, taste, and smell the same. It's not easy to do during average conditions, and it's extraordinarily challenging during very dry and very wet conditions. The committee analyzed changes in land use using the National Land Cover Database, which is, a, is the most consistent way to look at trend analysis. And we found the following, that the conversion of forest and farmland to developed areas in the west of Hudson, west of Hudson watershed has been almost not detectable. Uh, that's not a typo. That's uh, three hundredths of one percent of the watershed area. The east of Hudson region was greater but on par with places like Vermont and Maine. Both were much lower than New York State average, which in turn was lower than the US average and the US maximum, which is startling because of its occurrence in Arizona with all their water problems, was 16.2%. The committee's mass balance analysis of phosphorus in the Cannonsville Reservoir, uh, a particular watershed and reservoir that I'll return to again, and that our report focuses on as one of the most challenging sites, has shown that the rate of improvement has been measurable but slow, as you can see from the, the two graphs on the right. With respect to climate change, the principal concerns, again, um, Tropical Storm Irene may well have been an example of one, is that Global circulation models tell us that the Catskills region is likely to be subject to more intense storms and warmer conditions. And as you can see from the flow duration series on the right, the size and severity of those storms has been increasing fairly steadily over the last many, many decades. The stress test that I alluded to earlier was using this operation support tool a very sophisticated computer model that's linked to the New York City system to determine what would happen if, in a mathematical sense, Tropical Storm Irene followed by Lee were repeated over the entire system, not just the West of Hudson system, twice, to see if systems operations could accommodate that extraordinary stress and still deliver water uh, in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act limit of five bathymetric turbidity units at, at the outflow of the Kensico Reservoir. We found that that was, uh, was the case, 
And that led us to this conclusion that, that the system operations appear to be more than adequately able to protect water quality in the long term. Not without challenges, but uh, a reassuring result to be sure. The next chapters, the program review chapters, follow this template. We began by describing the program in detail. We looked at its effectiveness, and then we critiqued the program, again, in this anything can be done better mode to look for opportunities and recommendations that we could make for improvement in the face of things like climate change, invasive species, and regulatory change. Chapter five focuses on the agriculture programs, particularly the watershed agricultural program uh, on, on the Cannonsville Reservoir, where a rich data set was available to us. This very detailed, almost psychedelic image is the result of some terrain analysis and computer modeling of uh, something that you already understand intuitively, and that is water flows downhill from the hilltops to the valleys. And it follows that most stream flow is generated from those dark blue areas, the so-called saturated source area for stream flow. So pollutants and human activities in those areas are of particular importance when it comes to prevention and, and reduction. If you're 1,000 feet away, 2,000 feet away on a dry, well-drained hilltop, the likelihood of a measurable effect would be much, much less. This plot shows our committee's analysis of phosphorus data in soils provided to us thousands of samples by the Watershed Agricultural Program. It's a rather complex plot, but let me walk you through it. The two ranges that are noted by the dashed lines are high, and that is uh, concentrations of phosphorus that are at the upper limit of what plants, particularly agricultural crops, can use. And then above that line, very high concentrations, which is in effect an over-fertilized site that is, is ripe for off-site impacts of flow. The boxes show the range of variation of most of the samples and the solid black line shows the median value, the most common observation. And unfortunately, what you can see and what we saw in these data is that the highest phosphorus concentrations occur on the wettest sites immediately adjacent to the streams, and even small tributaries, which puts them particularly at risk of, of contributing to downstream flows and loading of Cannonsville Reservoir. So it follows that a watershed management approach that starts on the wettest sites with the highest concentration and works its way to progressively drier sites has the best, holds the best promise for long-term results. But treating what's there is, is important, but not enough in the sense these phosphorus loads are, are high enough that the committee also highlighted these two other recommendations. Commonly in, in Europe, in countries like the Netherlands and Belgium, manure and, and other biomass is turned into energy or other useful byproducts in something called a bioreactor, where the methane is harvested and, and used to pr produce electricity. That's one um, possible method of reducing the input of phosphorus to the watershed as a whole. Another is to build on the success of the precision feed management program and expand that to as many farms and animal units as possible. We also suggest that the Watershed Ag Program should transition from metrics of output, counting the number of BMPs installed, to more outcome-oriented objectives, determining the nutrient loading prevented by either field measurements, statistical analyses, modeling work, or some combination thereof. And finally, we suggest that the Watershed Ag Council and the New York City DEP should jointly develop a climate action plan for agriculture, and in so doing, revise best management practices to make sure that they're up to the task, the more stressful task of dealing with climate change in the future. This will largely entail um, changing design guidelines for some of the field practices. Chapter six focuses on the stream management program. We found that it stands out among stream restoration efforts nationwide. Other examples include work by the Forest Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but primarily in the Pacific Northwest to restore salmon habitat. But this is a much more ambitious program because in addition to um, the, the ancillary benefit of improved habitat, 
It aims to greatly reduce turbidity. We found it to be a helpful prototype that other watershed protection programs might emulate. That's not an implicit criticism of any other program. It's just to say that this program was the most complete example of the adaptive management paradigm and that mass balance approach because it uses a whole watershed or whole system approach with active partnerships. It builds scientific investigation into every project. It begins work with a stream, a comprehensive stream corridor mapping and prioritization method, and then uses the most appropriate tool ranging from very elaborate full channel restoration to simpler and more straightforward restoration of riparian forest buffers. And all the while water quality is monitoring what is monitored to uh, check the efficacy of, of the work. We do note, however, that more statistical analysis and ongoing analysis of that monitoring data would be helpful. Let me show you an example from that site I mentioned earlier in the, in the vicinity of Chichester, New York. The site on the, the pic, photograph on the right is the completed example of the, re, of the stream channel restoration. The tree seedlings are small and will soon be more evident. The, the complex graph on the right shows the changes in suspediment, suspended sediment over time. And I want to draw your attention to the logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. That is to say, if you look at the pre-construction um, loads of suspended sediment, and then the effects of the first part of the stream channel restoration, the first site, and then the cumulative effects of site one and two, you could note that at any given stream flow, that um, if I gave you some numbers, for example, what might have started out as, as 40 milligrams per liter um, in the black dots is now something like, um, excuse me, 400 milligrams per liter in the black dots is now 40 in the red dots and only four in the yellow dots. Now there's a great deal of, of variability as is the norm for watersheds, but the effect, at least the near-term effect of this program is, is plainly evident. We turned our attention in chapter seven to the land acquisition and, rec and recreation programs. The land acquisition program has the distinction of being one of the most essential programs in, in res with respect to the signing of the initial MOA, uh, the renouncement of eminent domain and the process of willing seller, willing buyer transactions, that clause, and also the issuance of the filtration avoidance determinations. But almost inevitably, it was the most controversial with watershed communities. It's been a, a very large program, as I mentioned in the introduction. It's ex expended almost $500 million, purchased or gained easements, purchased development rights, on 1,800 parcels and encompass about 15% or a little more than 15% of the total watershed area, 154,000 acres. But we find at this stage in, in the project and the program that the watershed acquisition program should focus more on lands in the riparian areas and in floodplains of tributaries, both large and small, that are likely to have a more straightforward and direct effect on water quality maintenance and enhancement. We also recommend that New York City work with watershed communities to identify parcels that New York City has purchased that have low water quality protection value, but may offer development or relocation potential that would be of, of a great help to watershed communities and end up serving both watershed protection and community vitality goals at once in the spirit and the letter of the MOA. The good neighbor uh, payments that were made at, a, at the beginning of the MOA, this would be a good neighbor collaboration. The example that was repeated to us over and over again in Margaretville is the grocery store, an essential service that occurs right in the floodplain the arrow happens to be the direction of flow that's confined by two state highways. So as you can see, that building more or less forms a dam just where you want it, uh, want it least during a high flow event like Tropical Storm Irene. Finding a four to five acre site to relocate that would solve two problems at once. And the precedent for this good neighbor collaboration is already there and, and most evident in this marquee example of success from the, the watershed 
Recreation Program, the recently opened Ashokan Rail Trail. Those of you who are familiar with the area would, I, I think, um, note that this would be unimaginable, this would have been unimaginable 30 to 40 years ago. It would have been implausible if it was proposed 20 years ago, even after the signing of the MOA. It's a reality today, and it's a remarkable asset for both New York City and watershed communities, not least because it's proximate to the new Catskill Visitor Center named in honor of Congressman Maurice Hinchy. Chapter eight focus on the wastewater programs throughout the watershed. And the graph on the right shows the early success of the wastewater treatment plants. The five, the last five wastewater treatment plants to come online brought about an enormous reduction in the annual load of phosphorus in those watersheds. But once those large point sources have been dealt with, the smaller non-point sources, the diffuse source pollution, septic systems, agricultural land use, urbanized land, show up in the inset graph on the right. And that led us to uh, both revisit the 2000 report and amplify and update the suggestion, the recommendation that the septic system, especially on sensitive sites, should use best available control technology um, and that is aerobic treatment units and absorption fields that are up to the task of, of uh, dealing with domestic wastewater in small confined valleys in difficult soils or some combination thereof. Stormwater management didn't rise to the level of the summary section of our report because the amount of developed land in the Catskills is relatively small, but it's, it's an important Program, a program of the Watershed Protection Program, especially in the east of Hudson region, and also a source of, of some consternation and, and concern in the, in the west of Hudson. The, um, the tools and techniques, the, the methods listed on the, on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, show how far stormwater management has come in the last 10 or 20, uh, even 30 years and the efficacy of, of some methods like bioretention basins or, or otherwise means of controlling stormwater runoff. In this case, 40 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids entered that retention basin and only 10 left, uh, a promising result. But on the other hand, phosphorus, that pollutant of particular concern, had the anomalous effect of, in some cases, the outflow uh, of the basin is greater than the inflow. How can that be? The retention basin stored phosphorus during the growing season. It enhanced the growth of plant, plants within the bioretention area. And then when they decomposed during high flows in the dormant season, fall rain, spring snow melt, that phosphorus was mobilized and carried downstream. So that led us to, to deal with a, a suite of questions and concerns in chapter nine that focus on the on-site or in-situ effectiveness of stormwater BMPs, how they may be influenced by climate change, and their, their expense. These are very expensive practices in relation to their source share, their partial contribution to pollutant loadings through in the watershed as a whole. Chapter 10 dealt with ecosystem protection and management activities, uh, largely on the forestry programs on state city and private lands, with a particular focus on private lands, because as you can see, they comprise the, the largest areas and the largest proportions of forest land in the Schoharie, Cannonsville, and Papacton Reservoir. At, at present, the Watershed Forestry Program influences, by their own estimate, about 40% of this land base. We suggest that it should be expanded to encompass as much of that land base as possible. We also urge uh, work, uh, partnership work to develop reliable markets for low value wood. It's easy to harvest high value saw timber and export it out of the watershed, but it's much more difficult to diversify the forest unless you can use a range of silvicultural techniques that maximize the number of species, increase the age class distribution and the heights and um, as an insurance policy against wind damage. One way to do that would be to look at wood chip gasification. Here's an example of a recently constructed plant 
on Middlebury College, which, produced, which replaced their oil burning plant, along with Bennington College and the very, very extensive Vermont Fuels for Schools program, as prototypes that we suggest might be applicable in the Catskills. A lot's changed, a lot's changed for the better in the last 20 years since the first Academy study, when pathogens were uh, at the forefront of everyone's area of concern. The two things that are responsible for uh, a, um, a dramatic, at least, reduction of those pathogen loads during the early part of the, the last two decades was the ultraviolet um, disinfection plant coming online and the cumulative effects specifically of the watershed ag program and the wastewater treatment plants and the septic program of reducing pathogen loading. But, and here's that usual but, there's an increasing trend in the last few years that we suggest needs to be studied in greater detail to determine whether it's uh, an actual phenomenon in the watershed or an artifact or a result of using more sensitive tests. We also urge in chapter 11 that um, microbial source tracking, tracking, a genetic technique that identifies the source of something like coliform bacteria to differentiate between human sources, agricultural sources, and wildlife sources in order to best uh, prioritize and identify water, watershed protection methods. The UV plan is a remarkable asset, but any, any barrier in the multiple, multiple barrier approach can ultimately be breached. So prudence is the watchword here. Chapters 12 and 13 uh, dealt with monitoring, assessment, statistical analysis, and modeling methods that would be in some form or fashion taken together um, ways of improving all of the program areas. Uh, in a somewhat of a departure from the usual scientific discipline of never saying never and never saying always, we put forth the recommendation that trend analysis should always be part of water quality monitoring and information uh, generation. And it should be subject to formal statistical trends. And furthermore, a mass balance approach to uh, compare different watersheds and their proportional contribution should be taken. This rather complex figure on the right is actually an excellent illustration of it. That's why it's included in the chapter in my presentation. It, it was authored by uh, one of our committee members, Bob Hirsch and his colleagues about a decade ago. Let me highlight a few things and, and tell you what, to, uh, what the take home message is. The first is um, what's called normalizing the data. Kilograms per day per square kilometer means that the, the mass of pollutant on a unit time on a unit area is calculated for each of these nine watersheds. They may be of different areas and, and, and characteristics, but now it's an apples to apples comparison of the nine sites done over a long period of time, more than three decades. So using a traffic light analogy, we might um, draw the following conclusions from this figure. Green, good to go that the variability of phosphorus loading is low in those four watersheds, not least the Susquehanna, one of the largest watersheds leading to the Chesapeake, and the trend line is holding steady. Yellow, as in the caution light, the variability is greater and the trend is, is less consistent. Uh, that leads us to ask, what's, what's the reason for that and what can be done about it? Red, as in stop, the Rappahannock River shows signs of increasing variability and an upward trend in flow normalized yield of phosphorus. That should be the first place we apply our attention, just like site, the wetness class 10 with high phosphorus concentration on agricultural land. And finally, the Patuxet watershed, not on the traffic light, shaded in blue, shows us that something favorable is going on in that watershed. Is that a result of the watershed protection activities or some natural characteristics, some combination thereof? That warrants further investigation as well. So whatever success is being enjoyed there could be repeated on the other sites, the yellow and the red sites. Chapter 13 deals with the, the pervasive questions of community vitality, economic viability, and social well-being and summarizes the, the 
just two studies that have occurred since 1999 of those elements of the memorandum of agreement and suggests that the watershed protection program and, and all the participants in it would benefit from the same systematic and scientifically based approach to census data, economic data, and social and social and community data as water quality data. This is a complex slide, inevitably, that, that shows um, the results of our work in chapter 14, the concluding chapter of our report, that focused on the question from our statement of task about balance. Let me break it in, into component parts and then put it back together. The first uh, graph here shows the, in effect, the law of diminishing returns. And that at the beginning of any project, once the problem is clearly identified and the data are analyzed, that the program is, is deployed and we can expect major improvements in water quality, for example. The project proceeds, it's a maturing project, there are still measurable improvements, but over time, incremental investments, the next thousand dollars, the next thousand dollars and so forth, are producing smaller or minor incremental benefits until finally, that model is producing little or no return on additional benefits. And in some cases, if conditions change, there are unintended consequences or both, there are actually negative benefits or adverse effects of a watershed protection subprogram. Clearly, number three, four, and five present opportunity cost in that if you're investing in program A and it's yielding no benefits or negative benefits, and that, that funding could have been invested in program B that is still in the large or medium return phase, that would, that would uh, be the preferred approach. So we did a best professional judgment review because the data aren't available to do this quantitatively. It could be, but they're, they're not available yet to uh, derive the sense of, of the relative performance and opportunities associated with several programs. I've highlighted waterfall management to show that we find um, small opportunities for improvement from increased investment both now and in the future because it's working well. Uh, it, it addressed a critical important problem back in the mid 1990s. It brought that, um, that problem under control and has remained within compliance with the surface treatment rule even in the face of Tropical Storm Irene, the red bar January uh, 12 noted there. By contrast, we believe that um, operationalizing our recommendations like the bioreactors, the waste to energy plants, the precision upgrading the pre precision feed program, improving BMP performance, would take the watershed ag program from its mature current phase with small incremental benefits from new investments to a new phase of large incremental benefits, both for water quality and community vitality. Where would the, fu the funding come from? By rebalancing among the programs. And it isn't exclusively the watershed ag program, but by adopting recommendations that we put forward to reduce the size of the land acquisition program and tighten its focus on riparian and streamside areas, floodplain buyout and others, to take a program that's having very small incremental benefits to water quality now and what we might, we believe are negative benefits to community vitality and convert it in a reconfigured way to medium benefits in each realm using the funds to um, improve the implementation and redesign of the Watershed Ag program. But again, I wanna emphasize funding could flow to other programs as well, like the Watershed Forestry Program, the Septic Program, um, increasing the scope of work of stream management and the like. So it follows that by uh, undertaking this analysis in as objective and careful a way as possible, uh, leading to the conclusion that reducing expenditures in land acquisition would allow us to better fund improvements in watershed ag, septic systems, and watershed forestry, the Catskill Stream Buffer Initiatives, and others. Um, that would be a worthwhile thing to, to take in, in consideration in the near term. Finally, we, we conclude with two statements that um, 
actually reflect the tradition of science to never say never and never say always. They might seem like um, rather faint praise or, or, or uh, a tepid conclusion, but they're not. Um, the DEP and Watershed Protection pa Program partners should be very proud of the pathbreaking approach and the monumental job well done to date. But we all know that it's a job that will never be finished because conditions will change and um, more, more work will always need to be done. We found that overall, the MOA, the Memorandum of Agreement, and the Watershed Protection Program that it led to have succeeded in maintaining this very challenging exemption to the surface water treatment rule and have, have well positioned the system to maintain that trajectory into, into the future. In conclusion, on behalf of our committee, we hope that our findings, conclusions, and detailed recommendations will be carefully considered and will contribute to the long-term long success of the Watershed Protection Program. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Barton, for that wonderful presentation. Um, so now we'll move on to the Q&A part of our session. Um, so uh, the floor is open for questions. Um, as a reminder to submit your question, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and um, type in your question there. Uh, so I'll start us off with uh, our first question. Uh, did the committee, and I think you mentioned this um, a bit already in your presentation, Dr. Barton, but did the committee consider the costs and benefits of just abandoning the watershed protection program altogether and filtering the Catskill Delaware supply? What did your considerations look like there as a committee? Well, in, in several ways, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Jay Lund to add to this in a moment, but um, abandoning the watershed protection program in some form is not an option, that all water supplies are required to undertake source protection. Reducing it in scope um, would, would be possible, but our preliminary analysis shows that that would be much more costly and much less effective than, than maintaining um, or improving what's already been happening. But I'd ask Jay to comment on that as well. Yes, we looked at this uh, fairly carefully uh, in a preliminary way, but I think in a, in a pretty insightful way. Um, and what we found that the protection program is, is really a, very much of a win-win program overall. Um, it's much less expensive than providing uh, similar water quality from filtration. It provides a lot of environmental benefits, a lot of recreation benefits, a lot of community development benefits up in the watershed. And it, it keeps the rates lower for uh, the people of New York City, which include a lot of folks that uh, have trouble paying rates. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that additional detail. Um, so our next question is, uh, did the committee consider structural risks to the New York City water supply um, from climate change, such as dam breaches, which I know was a concern during tropical storms, I mean, Lee? We, we didn't specifically. That wasn't within our, our statement of task or our scope of work. Thank you. Um, could you explain um, kind of in more depth about how the Watershed Protection Program as a whole has impacted communities living in the Catskills area over the past couple of decades? How has it changed their life and, and um, how they operate in that area? Well, I'll begin with a few general comments and then um, defer to Rich Stedman. But uh, the, the several ways and important ways are when the MOA was signed, it, it brought into full force an enhanced set of watershed rules and recommendations. Um, the effect of which is, is, is anecdotal because uh, the, the work hasn't been done yet to determine the, the true cost, economic or, or social. Um, it, it has led to um, um, some opportunities and, and some challenges, not least through the land acquisition program. Um, I'd ask Rich to add to that, please. Sure, thanks, Paul. Um, so, I mean, one of the the things that I would underscore that Paul just said is the, uh, the, the main answer is we really don't know. Um, you know, in terms of the amount of attention that has been placed on understanding community well-being, whether it's economic well-being, whether it's social well-being, compared to that that's been put on, put on water quality, which we know a great deal about, um, there's an awful lot of uncertainty, and that is one of our recommendations um, in the report, is that, is that we try to reallocate some resources to better understand community vitality for a few reasons. I mean, one, um, just so we can answer questions that, that 
like that were asked and 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 another um you know i think paul mentioned the good you know a good neighbor kind of kind of approach kind of a kind of a policy i think it would allow demonstration of linkages that are already there and potentially allow modifications to programs that that weren't serving those needs as well as they might i'll also footnote that by saying that um it should be considered the direct investment in infrastructure that's made in the Catskills, not least those wastewater treatment plants for many small communities is an enormous community benefit. Wonderful, thank you. Um, one comment came in through the chat that said that the comparative examples of other watersheds was very interesting. Um, and is there, what's the best process do you recommend for um, other cities and states to learn from the success of the watershed protection programs that you outline in your report? Um, Bob, would you like to take a turn at that? Not Maybe. quite sure I understood the question. Was, could you state it again, Megan? Yeah, of course. Um, what would be the best process for other cities and states to learn from the successes of the program that you outlined in your report? Well, I guess, you know, looking at this, at, at our report, you know, there would be a lot of detail about things that have been done and, and the results uh, of the effort. Um, and then the questions about what could be done to better analyze and understand what's going on. And I think we would emphasize the importance for anyone of constantly taking a mass balance approach and looking at uh, the pollutants of concern, be they uh, pathogens, be they nutrients, be they sediment, um, and evaluating uh, the progress. And that's evaluating over time as well as evaluating across multiple watersheds in order to better focus the uh, tensions of the program. I'd add that across the, um, the spectrum of land uses and, and land covers and activities that might produce something like phosphorus, if one water protection, water, um, watershed protection measure costs $5,000 per kilogram and another costs $5 per kilogram, do more of the latter and less of the former, or maybe not, don't even do any of the former because it's just too costly for such a, a very limited return. Great, thank you both. Um, could you talk more about the most um, innovative aspects of the Watershed Protection Program and uh, whether or not you feel that the NYC DEP is being uh, maybe a leader in the water supply area? Well, as I mentioned in that core concept slide, and, and I think I, I said once I try to collect myself from the technical difficulties were that um, uh, we, we, we really return over and over again to the memorandum of agreement as the template for cooperation and clear terms of reference between watershed communities, New York City DEP and, and state and federal agencies. Um, it's not easy, but, but it provides um, a, 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 a workspace within which these programs could be designed and implemented. Um, further, the, the active partnership approach, the Watershed Agricultural Program, Casco Watershed Corporation, um, smaller programs like Watershed Forestry and Casco Stream Buffer Initiatives, all, um, they, they have prototypes in other areas of the country and the world as well, but for them all to occur in one place under, under one, the aegis of the Watershed Protection Program is really quite extraordinary. If I could just add a little bit to it, um, there was a previous study by the Academy of the Watershed Protection Program, specifically something called the Operation Support Tool, which is a very innovative um, approach to um, help in day-to-day, hour-to-hour, day-to-day, month-to-month decision-making in this watershed based on watershed conditions and weather forecasts. Uh, this system has a great deal of flexibility in the operators needed a, a system to help them simulate the consequences of their decision of taking water from one place on one particular time and from another place at another time. And that tool uh, has been very helpful in making uh, them, enabling to make optimal decisions about where to take their water from at any particular time. Great, thank you, Brad. 
Um, another question from the chat. Um, it says, as you recommend shifting funding away from land acquisition, would you say that land acquisition up to this point um, has been successful in protecting important areas or has maybe it been misdirected? Well, I, I would say it, it, um, it's been based on something called the natural features criteria, which was agreed upon by the signatories of the memorandum of, of agreement. Um, it, it had focused of necessity on larger parcels early on because of the, uh, the imperative of, of earning and continuing the filtration avoidance determination. And in so doing, because of land use patterns and, and historical patterns, um, some of the land is less important or less valuable than others. But I might ask my colleague, Steve, as you swore Giaggi to add to that. I think that's a, a good start on that answer. It's been 20 some years since that program was begun. A lot of great progress early on. Um, but as you continue to buy high value lands, you're, you move down in priority. And so what we've suggested is that the program take a bit of a reset, examine closely how they measure success, moving away just from acres solicited to actual water quality value, in that they think about where the dollars are allocated, move dollars closer to the streams, the floodplain areas, the streamside buffers, um, worry less about large parcels further away. The city has moved to a place of having a reasonable fraction of the watershed owned. And then finally, as Paul mentioned earlier, thinking about if there are opportunities based on where we are now for uh, high, high, lower value lands to be essentially traded for other values. Are there opportunities to gain community vitality benefits by swapping lands and offering opportunities for communities to build on the uplands further away from the streams, perhaps which New York bought as part of large parcels early on? Um, and in the me as doing that, uh, deal with problems right at the stream edge. Great, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have time for uh, one more question. Uh, I'm wondering um, if anyone has anything uh, that they'd like to say about what they want New Yorkers, the, the last recipients of this water in the program, uh, to know about your report and what you found. Well, I, I think that, um, water consumers, both the eight and a half million people in New York and the one million people along the aqueduct, um, should be greatly reassured by the the sophistication of, of the program, the dedication of all the people who participate in it, and the results that have been sustained over this 20, 25 year period of remaining in compliance with the Surface Water, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act, come what may, dry conditions, tropical storms, and everything in between. Uh, none of that happened by accident. It's all a result of the dedication of everybody who has a, a part in the program. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for those remarks um, and for answering our questions. Uh, it looks like that's all we have time for today. Um, one final reminder, uh, once you exit this webinar, you will be redirected to our report page um, where you'll be able to download and read the report for free. Um, with that, I would like to thank our speakers and thank you all again for participating in this webinar.